Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm your host for today's session. My name is Aisha Sayed. I'm an MPhil in Education Policy and Development and I've done my Masters in Philosophy with a focus on Iqbal's philosophy of education. So today I would like to welcome you all to this uh, first of a series of programs, I'm sure, on the, the decoloniality, uh, the coloniality project. We're going to be discussing a brief history of colonialism in South Asia, as well as uh, prospects for decolonialism and post-colonialism. And we would also like to discuss the importance of uh, the background of decolonization of knowledge. And we have some very distinguished guests with us on this program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce the platform that is hosting this program today, uh, Skillers International, which is an Institute for Holistic Personality Development and Skill Building as well as Think Pakistan. We have collaborated to host this program. And Think Pakistan is an educational think tank. It is a unique uh, think tank comprising scholars and academicians from higher education institutions of Pakistan, as well as Pakistani academics serving in um, universities abroad. And this uh, organization has a membership of 1,000 plus academics, PhDs and young MPhil scholars from all across Pakistan and beyond. I would also like to introduce the distinguished guests who are with us today. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Sayyid Farid al who is joining us from University of Singapore. Uh, he is a very renowned scholar, and uh, we all know him as a very renowned sociologist. He is um, um, an author of uh, several works, and this project of uh, decolonization, this is a special speciality area with him. And uh, he has written numerous books on it. And he also carries the legacy of uh, Dr. Sayyid Hussain al Atas, who has uh, uh, also been a very prominent uh, sociologist and a political activist, uh, activist of the Southeast Asian region. So we welcome you to the program, sir. And we're very happy that you're joining us here from Singapore today. We also have our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Ishtia Gondal, who is a PhD in Islamic Studies and Assistant Professor in Sheikh Zayed Islamic Center, University of the Punjab, Lahore. He's a founding member of Think Pakistan, and he has a teaching experience of 30 plus years, as well as many publications. He's also a member of Board of Studies of many educational institutions. And we have uh, with us Dr. Safir Awansa. He's a pro-rector academic and Dean Faculty of English Studies He's joining us from Namal University, Islamabad, and Namal is a national university of modern languages. And uh, he has a vast teaching and administrative experience in the higher education institutions spread over decades. And he has worked extensively in curriculum development. And he's also involved in um, implementation of teacher training programs in various institutions. And he has remained chief editor of uh, many academic journals. And right now also he's a chief editor of Journal of Critical Inquiry, uh, which is published by NAMAL. So uh, along with that, I can see uh, many distinguished guests within the audience as well. I would like to welcome um, Dr. Shahid Siddiqui, who's joining us from NAMAL. We have uh, uh, Iftikhar Malik Saab, who's joining us from UK. We have uh, Asif Lukman Kazi. We have many other distinguished guests among the audience. So um, without taking up further time, I would like to directly introduce, uh, as I've already introduced the panel, I would like to request the panel to kindly uh, turn on their videos so that I may see them. Uh, Dr. Ishtiak Saab, if you're here with us, kindly uh, turn on your uh, camera. And uh, if Dr. Safir Awan Saab is already here with us, I would like to see you as well. Dr. Safir Awan Saab, if you're also here. Okay, I'll just uh, give you a brief overview of the topic. Of course, we have very specialists with us of the subject and they'll be giving you more details. We all understand this region that we call South Asia. And of course, we have a merger of South Asia and Southeast Asia today because we have Dr. Farid al with us as well. So we're talking about the eight countries that we know as South Asia. And uh, what has happened over here in terms of its history, we're just going to look at that. So South Asia includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. What has happened in South Asia? It is a land that has been invaded multiple times throughout history. 
from the ancient era of the Indus Valley civilization to the medieval era when Islam first entered the subcontinent through the conquest of um, Sindh by Muhammad bin Qasim. And we all know that the establishment of Delhi Sultanate after that, which comprised of several dynasties, a series of dynasties, Muslim dynasties that ruled this area. Then we know that uh, this area was ruled by Hindus and the Buddhists as well. And then we know that um, in the modern era of the Mughal Empire and beyond, and after the end of the Mughal era, we have the, um, what we call the modern period of the, uh, this subcontinent that starts from the 18th century and it starts with the um, invasion by the British Empire. And we have the colonialism and post-colonialism in which we are sitting right now. So this uh, area has a very vast history. It has a very vast, um, diverse history, in fact. And what we are trying to understand today is that it has been almost a century since our colonizers have left this area. All the colonies of uh, South Asia have been liberated or they have attained freedom or independence around uh, 1945 to 1960. So what we are trying to understand today is what has been the impact of colonization on this area. We're going to talk about the colonial hegemony, supremacy, slave mentality, closed mindsets. And we're also going to talk about tales of resistance from this area. What impact has colonization had on the mindsets, on the identity, on politics, on geography and history, on the education, on economy, on local cultures and traditions, and on languages? Are we really in the post-colonization era now? Have we come over whatever our colonizers, the impact of the colonizers had been on us? And where are we going in the future? So these are some of the things that will come under discussion. And I hope by the end of the session, we will have some clarity on these issues. So for the first um, uh, panelist, I've also already given you the introduction of Dr. Ishtia Gondal, who is an assistant professor at Sheikh Zayed Islamic Center, University of the Punjab, Lahore. And University of the Punjab, Lahore is also a gift of the colonizers. It is the oldest institution in Pakistan of higher education. And uh, we're going to discuss a brief history of colonization in South Asia, sir. I, I would appreciate Scalers International and Sister Aisha for arranging such a wonderful opportunity to discuss very interesting and very important topic. As she very rightly mentioned that I have to talk about the impact and uh, uh, influence of colonialism in South Asia in particular and over the world in general. You all know that all the social sciences and natural sciences introduce first of all Romans, uh, first of all Greek civilization, then comes Roman Empire, then we learn about Islamic era. And uh, all these periods tell us that there had been one or two driving force of the globe. When we talk about the Greek civilization, they tried to invade all of the globe. As we know, then we say, Fatah Alam, the conqueror of the world, the name of Alexander the Great come in our mind. And this power was replaced by Romans, then by Muslims. But when we talk about colonialism, formally as a term in political science and economy and in international affairs, it is introduced in the 15th century, which is the century of discovery. The next step, I would draw your attention and very important turning point in human history that is industrial revolution, which has great and deep impact on religion. And it introduced international economy and it introduced technology. The population of the European nation was so small and they were lacking in size of consumer market and they were lacking in natural and raw resources 
that's why they traveled in different parts of the world so colonialism starts from 15th century to some extent but it has different stages after industrial revolution colonialism was the system which was concerned with lot of social sciences like economics like sociology like political science and european nations invaded most uh, of the portion of the world in the previous century we had a concept of nation nation state and nation state was introduced evolved by west under the umbrella of colonialism in 21st century right now if we talk and listen or read about colonialism as sister aisha mentioned rightly that colonialism did not have any positive image though its defenders claim that they provided better infrastructure to the rest of the world they introduced the concept of human rights liberty equality they raised the literacy rate of the people living on this planet they introduced better health facilities before industrial revolution transfer of power in any society in any nation was associated with bloodshed and they made it possible that no transfer of power is peaceful and they claimed that democracy as a significant feature of west and their civilization is the destiny and the solution of all problems of mankind on the other hand in 2021 when we are having this series of lectures and brainstorming we cannot deny that the dominant aspect of colonialism is associated with brutality atrocities and the west themselves and western thought try to hide this brutality so in the 6th and 7th decades and 8th decade of previous century they gave new slogans new titles and open new avenues in academia that rest of the world is white man burden and they said we are going to harmonize the mankind and we are trying to build a peaceful uh, environment under the title of globalization what globalization was as a senior uh, bush ex president of america said in early 80s that we would introduce new world order and uh, one of the western scholars well known scholar jerry flu he wrote that uh, between 1990 to 2000 globalization was at its peak what globalization is they said that there are some financial institutions for the betterment of mankind they appreciated they introduced un its institutions its allied organizations and globalization was considered as the final destiny of the mankind at the same time american author foko yama foko yama ha wrote a book and its title was end of history but at the same time samuel huntington wrote a book conflict of civilizations and uh, a muslim scholar from bosnia ali izzat begwich wrote his book clash of civilization in the same perspective so it is very hard and difficult and complex phenomena to decide that when we talk about the impact of colonialism to what extent it is positive and to what extent it is negative but the approach and the outcome of western intelligentsia itself shows depicts that they had to change the title and the slogan 
and the mask of colonialism and they created new slogans that we do believe in a global village where peaceful environment would be provided to all the races all the nations but actually in this century all of us observe that they have been fired back globalization is the not is not the final destiny of the mankind they have been fired back issue of identity in the scandinavians in uk in france in america is at its peak and uh, they were of the impression in the end of the previous century that they are the only driving force of the globe and they thought that their entertainment industry hollywood would be the single driving force of the globe but it was uh, countered by indian industry korean industry and now we see that it has been questioned even at their own land i would draw your attention to the election strategy of donald trump in uh, previous election what he was saying he was not talking about new world order like senior george bush but he was talking about make america great america first so globalization was no more collective wisdom of west but it was questioned even at their own lands brexit which was burning issue for last two three years in the europe and england and the people of england they voted in general against brexit and european union could could not stop it um we're just having a brief background to what colonialism and its impact has been and i find it very intriguing that asia being the largest uh, population of the world or the concentration of uh, the world and it has been ruled by a handful of people who came as invaders and they were able to rule the people and this has happened in many many places and uh, it happened in europe as well so i think this is a very intriguing concept and our panelists will shed some light on how this is done how a small population is able to conquer a very large population and control it and have an impact that lasts even beyond a century welcome to the forum dr safira wan who is a phd in english studies and is also pro rector academic and dean faculty of english studies at namal university uh, welcome sir and i would like you to speak on decolonialism and post colonialism thank you very much for inviting me uh, but i wish that we could come up with um, a topic which uh, would be uh, also encompassing the contemporary state of affairs uh, because as a scholar of this field i believe that uh, colonialism has never ended uh of course colonialism has a very long history <clears throat> as dr ishta gondal was uh, saying earlier uh but i believe that we never entered uh, a decolonial state uh or the process of decolonization we started in certain places and certain states of course won their independence as well due to uh those uh, wars of independence that were fought for instance in places like algeria against the french occupation we also sort of won our independence uh, at least this is what the official narratives of history tell us uh, but i have always uh, had this feeling that and i also ask this question often uh, and put this up to my students as well Uh, whether pakistan is a post colonial state and in fact i am also responsible for writing a paper to this effect that is is pakistan post colonial uh, but this question is not like asking is the united states post colonial or is is canada post colonial of course they have a different sort of history but in my opinion um, unfortunately in spite of uh, winning uh, our independence uh, from uh, or at least the physical 
occupation when it ended in 1947, we could not be decolonized uh, properly. Because as we all understand in this um, galaxy of scholars and listeners, I'm sure we all understand that um, decolonization is not the same as post-colonization uh, because it continued in the form of neocolonialism and sometimes in the form of indigenous uh, colonialism, local colonialism, when the states themselves uh, become um, colonizing powers uh, for their masses. Um, and this is what has been happening and since independence. And um, if you, uh, you know, recall what Faz said very early on after uh, 1947, <clears throat> uh, that this is not the kind of uh, Sahar or Sub that we have been uh, waiting for. I am just trying to translate one of his famous uh, opening lines of uh, one of his poems. So actually that is the, uh, the, the true state of things. Uh, that we have just uh, transferred and kind of shifted uh, from one uh, state to another, but only uh, in, only in uh, you know, perhaps uh, epistemological terms, or there is no ontological difference between the, um, you know, physical occupation and colonization of the, of the states and uh, peoples, nations, in various parts of the world. As we know, that there was a time when almost 70% of, of this known earth was occupied <clears throat> by various colonizing powers of um, Europe. And this was just uh, a modern stage of uh, colonization, you can say, that started in from 15th century Renaissance onwards, when the West you know, woke up from its slumber and first there was a westward expansionism and then they uh, you know turned towards the east and they started occupying lands and they uh, you know occupied and they then started exploitation physical exploitation economic exploitation this is a well known story which people better than me have already narrated uh, very well and perhaps the most recent book in this field is that of Shashi Sarur uh, who is a novelist as well as a parliamentarian in the Indian parliament uh, the name of his book is um, An Era of Darkness, which is a very well documented uh, book, especially in terms of economic exploitation uh, of India. But as a teacher and researcher in the field, I always feel uh, that perhaps the damage that colonization, this modern colonization or Western colonization uh, and imperial project uh, had done uh, to uh, mostly Eastern uh, nations, um, that damage was uh, more in the realm of uh, ideology, in the realm of knowledge production, <clears throat> and in the realm of education. Because as we understand from scholars such as um, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian uh, jurist who was imprisoned as well, and from his book, uh, from uh, that is, uh, prison uh, notes from the prison house. Uh, we come to know a very helpful term to explain uh, what actually happened in uh, during those uh, times, and it still continues. And that term, as most most of us are aware, is hegemony. So hegemony, not in its common dictionary meanings, but in the sense that when people are occupied and they are controlled. Uh, and they, they are terrorized, um, then um, at the same time, at the discursive level, at the, at the level of control over various kinds of discourses, political discourses, social discourses, cultural discourses, people are made uh, uh, to realize that whatever is being done by the colonial powers, all of that is in the favor of the masses. And uh, they are here uh, for, uh, for, the, for the benefit of and for the enlightenment of uh, and for the progress of, uh, of the people. And that is why the British uh, were very, you know, um, 
uh, very you know active in, on on that front as well on the at the discursive front and they uh, introduced their language and particularly their literature i am as a you know student and researcher in in english studies i am quite well aware uh, that um, this uh, their their colonial project um, was very much uh, built upon uh, their educational policy and lord macaulay's famous minutes on indian education are there and we know from those minutes a document uh, that um, why and how they wanted to control the minds uh, of people and how uh, that you know control over the mind continues uh, i clearly i clearly remember that in 1996 when i was graduated from uh, university of the punjab in lahore and i was also fed on those same authors uh, which were the canonical authors of uh, the west uh, and um, you know i was quite uh, impressed by them but later on uh, during my phd studies fortunately i came to um i happened to read edward said and michel foucault and other you know great uh, minds of uh, resistance especially in in terms of decolonizing minds in terms of decolonizing the field of knowledge the production of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge over which they have total control even now uh, we are just talking about you know um, and we are just uh, Uh, being sad and we are just complaining uh, about uh, what is happening and what has been happening and what will perhaps continue to happen in the foreseeable future uh, but i think what we need to discuss on this forum and some some other scholar may uh, come up with uh, uh, a few thoughts on this as well that how to decolonize minds for example i understand Uh, that from the study of english from the study of english literature predominantly uh, which is still going on <clears throat> people who come out of the universities and the colleges uh, they are still slaves uh, to uh, all of uh, th- that uh, you know uh, knowledge and th- that mindset and therefore they continue to rule the masses uh, when they come to power Uh, through competitive examinations or through you know politics and their families businesses and all that they they continue with that um, you know colonial uh, mindset um, and it, it, and it's very difficult i remember that in 1996 when uh, i joined uh, my active service as a teacher and later on i, I joined international islam in islamabad there i tried to decolonize Uh, the syllabus of masters in uh, english literature and i tried to bring in comparative literature and pakistani writings in english and post colonial studies in particular uh, but there was resistance people thought that ma- ma english is perhaps not possible without studying uh, the canonical writers from shakespeare down to dickens and hardy and eliot and so on so uh, but anyway uh, we succeeded in that and later on critical theory was also introduced in that uh, which helped uh, a lot many of our students i fortunately was able to uh, you know uh, supervise um, more than 25 uh, phd scholars and all of them uh, are sort of resistance figures in their own departments wherever they are teaching and perhaps uh, the first essay which they like to teach and quote Uh, is uh, gugi wathyango's very famous essay uh, that is uh, abolishing uh, english departments so it was like you know uh, saying that uh, please uh, stop my own department and i would i would become uh, unemployed uh, after its abolition but believe me that this has been my feeling at that time but now uh, we have been able to decolonize our curriculum to to some extent of course um because still when our people get degrees in, in english and they go to uk and usa there they check what kind of subjects we have been studying but having said that we uh, still you know we continue our resistance and we are working on the 
decolonization of our cultural spaces, our mental maps, and I am uh, sure that if we continue uh, this struggle, there are a few more things also that we are uh, doing in our pedagogical practices uh, and in terms of our you know, research um, production uh, in Pakistani universities, especially in English departments, which are and which have always been a symbol of uh, you know, that colonial hangover. Um, and, but still, you know, we, we continue with that uh, struggle. So these are some of the initial thoughts uh, that I wanted to share with you. I can talk more about the relationship between knowledge and power and how to decolonize uh, the epistemological spaces as well uh, later on, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, brief but very precise presentation. And some very interesting questions. I'm sure the audience will have some uh, more questions. They're coming up in my mind as well. And I would like to know some things in detail from this program. But after we hear what our uh, final panelists for today, Dr. Farid al he has to share with us, because I'm sure the audience is really uh, eager to listen to him. And um, I just want to say that we've been looking at South Asia and Southeast Asia from um, a Eurocentric lens for almost a century now. The colonizers have gone, but we have been evaluating ourselves and formulating our concepts and our works uh, from their vantage point. I think they set the standards, they set the bars, and we're just trying to uh, live up to those things. So I hope that uh, today we can actually start some uh, process of decolonization and we can look at what post-colonization holds for us. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum and, uh, um, I, I'd like to thank Miss um, um, Aisha Sayed for, uh, and, and also Skillets for this um, kind invitation. So we, we are speaking about um, decolonization of knowledge. Um, the assumption is that we, we remain in a state of decoloniality, uh, in, in a state of coloniality. Um, that um, one phase of colonialism um, is over, uh, um, and may, what we refer to as um, political colonization. We are no longer directly ruled by the colonial powers, um, but we continue to be in a state of um, being dominated um, uh, politically, economically, culturally, um, and the cultural part, of, of course, includes um, um, knowledge production. So we, we recognize that we continue to be in a state of uh, coloniality, um, perhaps uh, in a different stage of uh, colonialism. Um, hence, we speak about the need to uh, decolonize. Now, um, when we speak about decolonization, uh, it is not simply a matter of uh, decolonizing knowledge. Um, for its own sake. Th th there is, of course, an interest in decolonizing knowledge simply because we want to, uh, to, uh, to not want to be alienated from our, our knowledge tra traditions, whether we speak of, of uh, you know, um, Islamic knowledge traditions or Hindu knowledge traditions or, um, uh, uh, you know, ethnic-based knowledge uh, traditions or the knowledge traditions of indigenous people, whatever it is. Um, we want to be in touch uh, or to re renew our um, uh, connections with these knowledge traditions and to look at the possibilities of generating new alternative uh, uh, knowledge. Um, so that is a goal in, a, in and of itself. But there's also a, another reason to decolonize, and that is because it is not only knowledge which is in a state of coloniality, but the world itself. Um, in other words, not, it is not only knowledge that is Eurocentric, um, the world itself is Eurocentric. Um, what I mean by that is that the world revolves around the interests of um, not the entire West, but um, the, the, the powers in the West, uh, certainly the United States, United Kingdom, some of the European countries. Um, you know, you look at um, the way resources are controlled, you look at the way international um, economic regimes are, are dominated, um, 
Um, you look at the the impact of uh, the ability of some of these countries to impose sanctions and the impact that that has on uh, our economies. Um, so it is not only knowledge production which is um, uh, Eurocentric, but the world itself is, is Eurocentric, uh, or it may be more accurate to say um, Euro-America centric. Um, so we need um, new forms of knowledge, we need alternative knowledge, we need decolonized knowledge, um, not only to be for the sake of being in touch with our knowledge traditions, but also to come up with new solutions and new ideas about how to, to organize the world itself, how to change the world itself. Um, now, uh, when we, we speak about decolonization, um, we um, uh, in inevitably um, arrive at the, the problem of intellectual imperialism and uh, academic dependency. I don't want to spend too much time discussing um, um, this point uh, because I want to go on to something else which I feel is very important. But um, I think what, what I'd like to stress is that when we speak about um, the problem of coloniality in knowledge production, um, the context, uh, perhaps you can say the structural context of that is what has been recognized for decades as the problem of um, intellectual imperialism or academic imperialism or academic uh, colonialism. Um, now related to, to this problem of intellectual imperialism is the problem of academic dependency. Under the system of domination um, that we call intellectual imperialism, that system creates a um, a, a state of, de of dependency on the dominant knowledge powers. So let's say if we say that today in the world, the dominant knowledge powers are the United States, the United Kingdom, um, France to some extent, to some extent Germany, not the entire West. For example, Portugal um, uh, is not, it's in the West, but it is not a dominant uh, knowledge power. Um, neither is, uh, is Spain, um, neither is Italy and neither are, you know, the Eastern European countries. Um, but um, um, so we, the, the knowledge powers refer to specific um, um, academic communities. The situation of intellectual imperialism had, had over this, the decades created um, a form of dependency that we can call academic dependency. Um, some of the features of this, of this academic dependency are as follows there is the dependency on ideas, right? In the process of knowledge production, we are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly dependent on ideas, concepts, theories um, that um, were created in these knowledge powers in practically every discipline in the uh, human sciences, uh, in the social sciences, in the humanities. Um, there's also dependency on the medium of ideas, on the media of ideas. For example, the publishing houses, the, the journal... Um, uh, the, the journals um, and, and um, working paper series and so on. We, we generally strive to publish in the, the international journals. And of course, the vast majority of these international journals are journals published in the UK and the US, and, and they are published by, um, by um, publishing houses that are based um, in the UK and the US, and also editorially uh, run by people who are based in the UK and the US and are generally in the in the English uh, language. Um, now there's also, uh, there are several characteristics of academic dependency, um, the dependency on ideas, on the media of ideas. Uh, another characteristic is the dependency on demand. Um, in other words, we in the, the global South are very much dependent on demand for our academic uh, skills. Uh, and I'm here referring to the brain drain, right? In other words, we are not employable um, or, or we find it difficult to find employment in our own countries and we seek to go abroad, generally to, uh, to the West. Um, so there's even a dependency on, uh, in, in that respect, demand for our, our skills. And this is, of course, known as the brain drain. And there's also um, you know, a very um, um, insidious form of dependency, which is dependency on recognition. Um, it has come to the stage where in, in many countries in the South, um, our 
careers, our intellectual careers, our, our academic careers, depends on the extent to which we are recognized outside of our countries and not in our countries. Um, you know, why? Because our promotion and uh, uh, tenure and our um, careers basically are dependent on the extent to which we are recognized um, by our peers, by scholars in the, the global um, uh, you know, system of uh, uh, knowledge production. Um, for example, uh, the extent to which your papers and your works are cited in the international journals that are within the the ranking, you know, the dominant ranking regime, such as uh, ISI uh, uh, and uh, uh, Scopus and so on. Um, so if you write in your own language, um, if you write in Urdu uh, and you are highly cited within Pakistan, or if you write in Indonesian and are highly cited in Indonesia, in Indonesian language journals, um, you are still not recognized um, by your university as a uh, you know, as a great scholar, because you are not known outside. You're not known in, in the West. Uh, you are not cited in the, in the correct, in the right, in the prestigious uh, journals. So our careers also depend on our being recognized outside and not within our own um, intellectual or academic uh, communities. Um, now, the, the problem with this, there are so many problems, and I don't have time to discuss all the, the problems. But let me just, you know, refer to one, um, one problem that the result, and this has happened in many countries. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm told by my, my friends in, um, in the Arab world that um, it's difficult to find um, good quality, you know, high quality um, uh, contributions to Arabic language journals because the better scholars pu prefer to publish in English. Um, again, for this reason of recognition, for this reason of publishing in highly ranked journals, um, because those would be recognized by their universities uh, and those would be um, what enables them to get their promotion and tenure and, and so on. Um, so there's a reluctance to write in Arabic, at least among the better scholars. And the same thing is happening in, in my country, in Malaysia. The same thing is happening in many countries. I'm not sure whether it's the case in, uh, in Pakistan. Um, but this is a trend that is that is uh, developing uh, all over the south. So what what you end up having is lower quality material written in the social sciences and humanities in um, the local languages. Um, and the problem is not only that we will not have good quality material lit written in Arabic or Urdu or Indonesian or Malay and so on, but the problem also is that language itself becomes um, merely um, a tool of translation to the extent that works are translated from English or from French or other European languages into the languages of the, the global South. Um, in other words, language is not seen as a repository of ideas and, and, um, and concepts. Um, this is an outcome of, um, this is an outcome of two things. One is being dependent on ideas from the global uh, north. Um, and uh, it is also an outcome of um, the, the language um, becoming less and less a medium of communication, uh, a medium of scientific uh, communication. Let me just give you a very simple um, you know, e example. We take the, the, the term religion. Now, this really shows the backwardness of the, of, of the um, human sciences practically all the social sciences, um, but particularly um, sociology, anthropology, um, I would say geography and psychology as well. Um, the backwardness lies in the fact that in the field of the, stu in the, field of the study of religion, um, via these various disciplines, almost the entire set of conceptual vocabulary comes from one religion basically from Christianity, right? If you open up any textbook um, uh, in sociology, for example, on, uh, uh, on the sociology of religion, you'll find that the conceptual vocabulary comes from, uh, you know, from, uh, from Christianity. Uh, key terms, uh, the term religion itself, uh, the, um, sect, denomination, cult, and so on and so forth. These are all derived from Christianity, but are used in a universal manner to talk about all religions. Um, 
so uh, in in a, in a sense, you know, um, uh, the 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 understanding of church as organization is transferred to to Islam, even if the term church is not used. But the assumption um, is that uh, religious organizations such as the church exist in other other religions. Um, and you know, this is uh, interesting. I um, in a, in a text uh, textbook, a sociology textbook by the famous uh, British sociologist Anthony Giddens. Um, he has a table in the chapter on religion. He has a table on um, um, uh, religious um, on religiosity, if I'm not mistaken, um, which he measures according to uh, church attendance. Yeah, um, and the categories in the table are trinitarian and non-Trinitarian religions, both of both referring to Christianity. Um, but he also lists um, under the, you know, uh, in, in that table on church attendance, he lists um, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, and other religions. Um, so, uh, so the assumption is given that there is such a thing as uh, the church, as an organization. So this is extremely uh, problematic because it results in a distortion of the of the understanding of other uh, uh, religions of the religious of the experience uh, of um, the people of other religions and also of the categories um, and, and it results in a in a, marginali a marginalization or a silencing of uh, the categories uh, that are used in other um, uh, religions. So this. To me, this shows it illustrates the extremely backward nature of and the parochial nature of the uh, of the social sciences. Um, you know, I have so many. You know, I, I would like to, to 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 say so many other things about this problem of this dependency on on ideas. You know, maybe we can take them up in um, in the um, um, in, in the in the question and answer session. Uh, but let me just say this: um, scholars from the West are coming to our part of the world uh, and they're giving speeches and lectures about Islam, about Hinduism, about um, you know, uh, Confucianism and so on, um, and using their terminology, using their categories. Sometimes their categories result in a distortion. The example, of course, the, the, the classic example is how the, the religion that we call Hinduism is a result of a colonial distortion. Um, because if we, we look at the work of Al-Biruni, Abu Rayhan Al-Biruni in, um, in the 11th century, uh, when he, he spent 13 years in India, um, it was clear to him that there was no single religion um, and there was no name, Hinduism, right? Um, when Al-Biruni said Hind, when he said Hind, the people of Hind, he did not mean a religion. He meant a community of people, uh, which he understood um, practice many religions because the terminology he uses is Adiyan al-Hind, the religions of Hind. Um, but all these different Adiyan al-Hind, the different religions of Hind, were put and lumped under one category by the Europeans and then called Hinduism. So here you have a gross distortion of, uh, of a reality. Um, so, um, you know, that's why the, the, the whole task of decolonization is indeed a very serious uh, um, task, a very serious um, endeavor. But I, I, I want to, uh, to, to end um, by, by saying that the problem of knowledge, decolonization is only one problem in knowledge production. Um, there are other forms of domination which we across the global south, and certainly this is the case in the Muslim world, um, there are other problems of domination of knowledge which we also need to deal with at the same time. There are at least four other problems. There are at least four other forms of knowledge domination. One of them is the state, right? Um, uh, in many Muslim countries, you have authoritarian states, and the state interferes in the process of knowledge production, sometimes in a very serious uh, manner, such that um, um, knowledge production is, is uh, you know, is, um, uh, you know, is, is not just controlled, but, but even stunted. Um, this has to do with the problem of lack of uh, freedom of expression, 
um, with the control of discourse, with the banning of books, and uh, and so on and so forth. So, and you are of course very familiar with uh, you know with these uh, problems. Um, you also have uh, the problem of androcentrism, which is male domination, right, in knowledge production. For example, very little, uh, and this is also in the West, but probably to a greater extent in the Muslim world, the, the lack of um, attention to, um, for example, women founders of, uh, of certain fields, uh, women founders of sociology, women founders of anthropology, um, the, um, the theoretical and conceptual contribution of women in the 19th century to the new emerging fields in, uh, in various disciplines uh, across the, the world. Uh, but that applies to the, the Muslim world uh, as well. For example, in Indonesia, um, uh, Raden Kartini, um, living at the, the, the beginning of the 20th century during uh, the colonial period, was a very important um, uh, woman. She had, had original ideas. Uh, one can, um, can derive a theory of colonial society from, uh, from her writings. But generally, she's not um, uh, given the attention that male thinkers um, during her time um, have been uh, given, both within as well as outside of, uh, of Indonesia. We can say the same thing about um, the 19th century, late 19th century Indian um, uh, thinker, um, uh, Pandita Ramabai Saraswati, um, whom my colleague Vanita Sinha has worked, wor worked on. Um, again, not given that same kind of recognition um, that um, her male contemporaries were, were given. So there's a lot of work to be done in the case of dealing with the problem of androcentrism uh, as well. Um, now, there are two other problems of domination. Um, now, all these problems have little to do with coloniality. They are own internal problems, right? Now, the, the two other problems, you have the weight of tradition. The weight of tradition. Um, when I'm here, of course, when I'm talking about um, the Muslim world, I'm talking about Islamic tradition or Muslim tradition. Um, sometimes this tradition, it's a tradition, these are, these are traditions among Muslims, but they are not necessarily um, Islamic. I, I would, I'd like to give you a very simple example. I, I, I won't go into the details. Um, we have uh, um, a, a dominant view um, about um, the event of the, the killing of the, the Jews of the Bani Qurayza. This is the time of the Prophet. I think you know, some, many of you will know the, the story. And this is a story that is told um, in the Sirah and handed down from generation to generation. Um, according to the story, you have the tribe, a Jewish tribe, the Bani Qurayza, who um, um, were, were said to have um, gone back on their agreement with uh, the Muslims in Medina um, they, they had agreed not to fight alongside the, the Quraysh against the Muslims in Medina. Um, this was at the Battle of the Khandaq, the, the, what do you call it? The Battle of the, um, of the, the, the Trench. Um, now, according to the, the account that, has, that is universally accepted, uh, almost universally accepted by, by Muslims, is that um, because of this um, reneging on the agreement, uh, um, perhaps some of the members of the tribe, a handful, uh, may have reneged on their agreement. The entire tribe was executed with the uh, agreement of, the, of our prophet, uh, the entire tribe. In other words, it was a kind of collective punishment for the misdeeds of uh, a few people. Now, this is universally accepted. Now, I can't go into the details, but what I want to say is, here you have a, a problematic you know, um, uh, idea um, a, 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 you know, one could even say a myth that had been handed down. Um, and these myths are used in our community. For example, Al-Qaeda. Uh, it was, it was uh, I can't remember, an Al-Qaeda or an ISIS. Um, I think it was an ISIS, a Russian ISIS. You know, you, you can find it on the internet. A Russian ISIS uh, fighter had told the Muslims, you know, he told the Muslims, why are you upset that we are killing Christians? The Prophet himself killed 900 um, uh, men of the, of the tribe of the Bani Qurayza. Um, so we are doing the right thing. So these ideas, um, these myths are being used um, you know, to, uh, uh, by, by extremists. 
Um, but you have um, very few people among the Muslims who critique such dominant notions, who could critique ideas that have, been, have become part of the tradition. Um, in this case, you have the Indian scholar Barakat Ahmed, who um, wrote, I think, in the 70s. Um, uh, he was a uh, very interesting background. He was an Indian diplomat. He was trained in the, in the American University of Beirut and, and also, uh, I believe, a doctorate in, um, uh, from the University of Tehran. Um, he wrote a very interesting work called Muhammad and the Jews, right, uh, which was published in India. Um, in which he uses the sources, the Arabic sources, and the early sources, the Sirah and the Hadith and so on, um, and a, a combination of the sources and a combination of logic to say that the account that has been handed down from generation to gen generation could not have happened. What the account says happened logically could not have happened. Uh, I won't go into the details because there's no time, but I'm, this is just to give you an example that we have our own internal problems Coloniality of knowledge is one, but we also have internal uh, problems um, which, um, um, which, which relate to androcentrism, which relate to uh, the control of discourse by the state, um, and also the weight of our, um, our tradition. And finally, um, religious extremism. I can tell you in my country, in Malaysia, we are suffering from the problem of religious extremism in terms of its impact on knowledge production. Religious authorities who have a great deal of power are able, for example, to, to get the ministry uh, of, um, the, you know, the relevant ministry in Malaysia to ban books. So certain books are banned because they are said to uh, insult Islam or they are said to you know, confuse the minds of uh, the Muslim masses and, uh, or tarnish the image of Islam and so on and so forth. Um, they have that power the religious authorities have that power. Um, they, um, we also have uh, experience in Malaysia and Indonesia, and I think the same thing has happened in Pakistan and other countries, sectarianism. So in the case of Malaysia, we've had um, uh, a wave, you know, during the last uh, 10 years or so of, um, of anti-Shiite uh, hate speech, uh, the spread of, um, the spread of, um, um, you know, um, stereotypes, um, um, false stereotypes about uh, Shiism. For example, the idea, this is widely you know, circulated in Malaysia, that Shiites have a different Quran. They have their own uh, Quran. Um, or um, that uh, um, Sh Shiites approve of, um, um, of um, you know, uh, they, they say that the blood of Sunnis is, is halal and so on and so forth. Um, we have these problems too. Um, now, it, and, and, and the religious extremist discourse dominates academia as well. So as a result, um, Shiites are not able to speak out or speak up um, to defend themselves. Neither do Sunni scholars who know that these, uh, you know, these the, the sectarian uh, accounts and sectarian scholarship because the universities sometimes organize hate speech, anti-Shiite hate speech in the form of conferences in the uh, universities. The Sunni scholars who know better and know that these things are not true uh, also fail to come, you know, to, to, to intervene um, and to, um, you know, to, to correct the, uh, the discourse. So if you look at the problem of coloniality, there are serious problems with, 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 um, um, that have to do with the colonial nature of, um, um, of uh, knowledge production. At the same time, within our own societies, within our own states, we have very serious uh, problems to do with the state, the weight of tradition, extremism or sectarianism, and androcentrism. Uh, and, and these problems, especially the problem of the state, extends to the male administration of our universities, the poor state of our universities, the lack of infrastructure, um, the, 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 um, the lack of um, you know, rule of law and regulation within the university uh, system. Uh, and and you know, this, I, I, I'm of course referring to my country. I not, uh, want to, to, to say this about other countries, but you all know about you know, the, these problems in your own respective uh, countries um, and, uh, and universities. 
Um, so let's be interested in colon, 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 the problem of coloniality. Let's be interested in decolonizing knowledge, but let's also be open uh, and honest about the problems that are that are of our own creation, and deal with those problems at the at the same time. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've taken a bit long, um, oh. very long actually. Thank, uh, thank you, you very thank much. You very thank you very much, Dr. Farid. And I'd like to open the house for questions with uh, one verse from um, our poet philosopher. Alama Muhammad Iqbal. Alama Iqbal says that Europe ki hulami pe raza mand hua tu, mujko to gila tut se hai, Europe se nahi hai. So he says that the colonizers are doing their work. They've just done whatever they wanted to do. So what have you been doing? So he's uh, trying to talk to the Muslims and saying that if somebody has been able to come and colonize you, I'm uh, more... Uh, uh, I'm more angry with you than them because they've been doing what they wanted to do. Well, assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you very much, um, Aisha Sayyid and uh, your organization. I am just here as a listener and I was fascinated by all the three speakers, and especially uh, Prof Professor Farid al Atash, because um, he feels that there are problems of two kinds. One, the external kind, uh, because of the colonial empires, the European empires, and then we have developed our own hegemonies. Uh, and uh, we can't, you know, sort of use uh, this external colonialism, the legacies of uh, European colonialism to sort of uh, take our attention away from what has been happening to our societies, to our educational system. Um, Professor uh, Atash uh, didn't mention it, I know out of uh, modesty and humility, his uh, late father was one of the great scholars, actually, who in the 60s and early 70s, you know, talk about this unevenness which the modern European empires uh, created. And this is where a kind of inferiority complex and a very hierarchical view of the colonized societies, you know, the, quote unquote, the native people were dished out. Uh, I am a student of history, as you rightly said, and I look back at human history, um, if you allow me, in a rather of cursory way. For a long time, we were tribal people. We were divided into clans. We were maybe nomadic, but very limited in terms of our mobility. So for a long time, human history is history of clans and tribes. And then from those clans and tribes, we became the empires. And these empires were traditional empires all the way until early recent or modern times. So um, on the one hand, we could say that, you know, Europe or the knowledge that came down from Europe and generally starts with Greece and, uh, you know, with Romans and then the medieval period and the modern European period. And these become, Europe remains the core engine or the core region of, um, in, you know, world history. And uh, this is where some of we historians have been making noises that, um, you know, Africa, Middle East, uh, Asia, Latin America, pre-Columbus native communities, or Aborigines in Australia, they all have been there for thousands of years and with their own histories. And that knowledge should be taken aboard. Um, I remember the first time uh, when there was um, uh, uh, an exhibition on art, uh, African art, uh, at the British Museum here in London, uh, somebody told Picasso, you know, one of the most famous artists of the 20th century, oh, Mr. Picasso, there is um, an exhibition, a uh, first ever on African art in London. And Picasso said, African art? Never heard of it. So this is a very complex problem and it's a multi-layered problem. And uh, I should say, it, you are, started your session by asking this question, how come? These small countries like Portugal or Spain or England or Holland were able to build huge empires. As a student, I, if history, I could give you lots of reasons. But I think one major reason was the knowledge capital and the knowledge which uh, some of these um, you know, countries were able to accumulate or create, especially uh, in England, I would say, or in France. That knowledge capital about geography, about world communities, and in the kind of dynamism that came along, you know, the mobility. I mean, we don't like to use the word age of discoveries or whatever, but this was the beginning. And I think you, you can't ignore the role of Renaissance, for example, uh, how Renaissance created a very dynamic, uh, critical 
um, you know, outlook, especially in Western Europe. And reformation, I think this is where Professor Frida Latash, uh, you know, argument is very valid that um, reformation and counter reformation uh, weakened the role of uh, clerical authority in Europe. And it allowed kind of more mundane outlook uh, to the, you know, situation in Europe and to the world outside. So these were different factors. But I think the difference between the European empires, and don't forget the Russian empire, which controlled a huge area uh, in Eastern Europe and Asia, and especially Central Asia, the predominantly Muslim regions. So I think uh, the difference between the early empires, whether the Mughal empire or Safi empire in Persia, or you had Mali empire in Africa, or you had the Mings uh, in, in China, the difference was that the modern empires had lots of different complex institutional structures. I mean, of course, Christianity was a major part of it, and you could see the demographic changes which has happened. I mean, the four continents, North America, South America, parts of Africa, and totally Australia and New Zealand became Christian. But other than religion, I think the institutional infrastructure, the economic instit the institutions, the educational institutions, the cultural institutions, the political institutions, the legal institutions, were created by these empires. And though the empires, in a literal sense, have gone away, but those institutions have become even more complex. Today, I mean, I know we talk about the IMF, we talk about the World Bank, we talk about all kinds of those organizational setup. And don't forget the military, uh, you know, part of that institutional setup. In most of the post-colonial countries, the very organization of all the three branches of military are very much patterned on what the Europeans established in these regions. So I think all these things are very important. Also, I think the Navy, for example, when I read about uh, uh, Abbas, uh, you know, King Abbas the First, uh, Abbas the Great, I mean, on one hand, he was the builder of the empire in Persia, like Akbar, akbar -e azam in uh, India. But he had to seek help from East India Company. Can you imagine to get back, you know, some of the ports that the Portuguese had captured in the Persian Gulf? So it means that even our defense infrastructures of these huge land-based empires, like the Chinese, like the Safids, and like the Mughals, were almost zero. I mean, the Portuguese could kidnap the Hajis coming from Malaya or from India, going to Arabia. And so there are all kinds of these stories. So I think we, we ignored our, our you know, uh, leaders of the time, late medieval period, early modern period, they ignored all these areas. And this is where the European powers were able to establish those institutions. And those institutions have left their legacies. The second thing I wanna say is that um, from the 60s onward, there has been a conscious movement to sort of universalize knowledge and to take it out of the hegemony of the West. And this is where you know, some of these Western societies opened up, some of the university you know, related academics started questioning the way uh, non-European histories were being taught. For example, Africa was called the dark continent. And dark does not mean just dark. It meant the whole cultural, intellectual, you know, denigration of the continent. Or medieval period was called the dark ages, the time when, uh, you know, people like Al-Biruni or Ibn Sina or Ibn Rushd you know, were writing and uh, were, were, you know, involved in all kind of intellectual debates. And so, so I think from 60s, we see a movement of uh, a kind of uh, universalizing scholarship. Uh, and then it picked up uh, with Sayyid Atash uh, and uh, more recently, uh, as it was mentioned by Professor Avan, uh, by Edward Said. And now I think in, in, in the last two decades, I see that there is a very, very, organized kind of intellectual, social, uh, and activist kind of movement at different levels to decolonize, especially the humanities. I mean, I don't think this is a major problem in sciences, though I know the structure of scientific education or natural sciences and how the universities teach these courses and how they organize their labs and how you know the scholarship from the West is being imitated or being reproduced and a kind of scientism uh, is being created in the developing world, which is a separate field. But I think I am more concerned about humanities and about liberal arts and, um, of course, economy, which have been mentioned. 
So there is this awareness, but I think we need to make efforts in a way that we do not close our windows on the knowledge, which is coming from all kinds of directions. Maybe we could get some inspiration from the Japanese uh, example, how the Japanese were able to absorb Western scholarship without losing their own cultural rules. And more recently, how China, for example, has been acculturating all the Western sciences and knowledge uh, that you know, thousands of Chinese acquired over the last two decades. So I think we need, at one level, indigenization of this scholarship. The second thing I'm deeply worried about is, as Professor Alatash was saying, that within our own societies, this critique should not help the fundamentalist and sectarian groups to deny knowledge and sharing of knowledge and scholarship. And this should not become a political slogan of anti-Westernism, that we start, you know, further disliking the West simply because West has intellectual or economic and you know, political hegemony at a global level. And this is where I'm worried about, that our critique of um, you know, colonial hegemony could strengthen some of those groups which are already very much resistant uh, to the new areas of scholarship. So we have to be very, very clever and we have to be very, very careful that how far we become active in our criticism, which is very genuine criticism of this intellectual or this multiple form of hegemony that we have inherited uh, from colonization, but at the same time, without losing the balance, without closing the windows, which open on all kinds of you know, academic domains. And this is where I think we have to be creative. So at, some le- at one level, a little bit of reaction, a little bit of rejection, a little bit of awareness of how Macaulay and post-Macaulay, you know, the traditions of scholarship and knowledge have been mutilated. But at the same time, what is the way forward? How we develop new epistemes? How do we develop uh, languages? And we don't need to reject French or Russian or English or German for that matter. But in the process, we also discover our own cultural contribution, our own literary contribution, our own heritage. And I think that is where the real empowerment will happen. And this is where the universities have to play a very important role. And this is where the indigenous elite intellectuals, they have to enter into a debate without going to two extremes, total rejection and total assimilation. Sadly, so far, these are the two responses that we see from the post-colonial world. Either we are totally rejecting everything which is coming from the West and we are suspicious of everything, or we are totally assimilating, copycatting. We have to find a way which should be creative while being aware of all the pitfalls. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for sharing these lovely insights with us and they are very helpful and we're going to convert them into something meaningful and practical in the future, inshallah. As Alama Iqbal has given us a very good model of a balanced critique, I would say, I hope uh, if the Kharsa would agree, that he has given us a balanced uh, example of how balanced critique can be done. He has been very critical of uh, colonialism and imperialism of the West, but at the same time, he has acknowledged and given um, uh, is the share or due where the credit is due. So um, I think we have that uh, indigenous model to follow over here. Like he has said that Mashrik se ho bezar na magrib se hazar kar fitrat ka ishara hai ke har sab ko sahar kar. I see some hands raised from amongst the audience. I'll just start off with questions of my own. So ma'am, can I, can I ask a question, please? I am Ji, please allow go me, ahead. Please. Please. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Latash and Professor Iftikhar Malik for their fascinating ideas. I am Sir Fahim Marshall from University of Sargodha. I am, you know, I am still in the infancy of my career as a lecturer in English. So my question is basically, uh, you know, from your talks, uh, what I have gathered that um, certainly there is an ideological work in shaping up the world views. You see, the, the way we prioritize the Westerners or the way they have themselves established as privileged 
vis-a-vis the Eastern or the Southern cultures. So we all know, sir, the problems or the issues which have really retarded the progress of the Eastern societies. But what are the solutions? What do you think? Because um, you see, sir, uh, the supremacy of the Western languages is a well-known fact. And we are all complacent. You see, sir, language is the basic tool which uh, really, you know, provides impetus to establishing these privileging or superiority or supremacy of the Western world. If, you, if we stick to our regional languages, then how can we, you know, counter the onslaught of the Western culture, which is, you know, being promoted through social media and other, you know, medium? if we solely rely on our regional languages, because we won't be given space if we are not writing in English. How can we be heard? How our voices will be heard or how will they be able to reach to the, uh, you know, the, uh, where we can really make some, uh, some impression. So what do you think, sir? How can we really empower ourselves without assuming the powerful outlook or the powerful position because this world is based, is framed on power relations, the relationship between, between the powerful and the powerless. It will go on and it has been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. Powerless okay. have been suppressed and powerful have been dominating. Sorry, I just okay. got... No, no. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the question. And it is a very important question because our academic spaces for now, they are being dominated by the English language. And just as Professor Altataj said that uh, for publications and for journals, we have to have a certain standard of the English language. But why can't we start our own things? Why can't we get over this? I think this is also a part of our uh, colonial mindsets that we want acknowledgement from them. We want... Uh, to be praised by them. So uh, I really like the model that Sayyid Farid al Sahib is presenting for Pakistan. And I hope this is just the first of a series of lectures and the decoloniality decolonial, uh, project to uh, really uh, come forth in Pakistan. So he's suggesting that we go for uh, online journals, we go for publications of our own, we go for shorter publications instead of uh, detailed uh, academic articles, we could go for uh, some shorter publications. If uh, Farid al Sahib would uh, like to comment on this, because he has some ideas for Pakistan and uh, for South Asia on how we can uh, overcome this language barrier. Mm. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, this, th these are issues that um, we have been you know, discussing um, for a long time um, in our own context in, in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, and elsewhere as well. Um, you know, the, the, the problem, I, I think, essentially is that uh, our universities um, are um, obviously controlled by the state, by the government, by, you know, by ministries of education, and they have set the, the parameters um, and they have, um, they have required that we have, uh, you know, um, certain um, requirements, certain key, key performance indicators and, and so on that lock us into that system of um, um, academic dependency. So when, it, when you look at it from the point of view of the structures, it's very difficult to change because basically you need change from the top. In the, minist the ministries of education, uh, the um, and then of course the the um, the administrators of the universities, such as the vice chancellors uh, or the rectors, uh, the deans, and so on, uh, and that's extremely difficult to uh, to bring about. Um, but on the other hand, we can't simply wait and do nothing. Um, so I think the the idea, and, and we have you know at least in in our context, and I think this is happening you know throughout the south, um, people are working from the bottom. Um, uh, you know, starting um, study groups, reading groups, um, starting uh, publications. A lot of youth um, who are dissatisfied with with the um, formal university education. They may be students, um, and they are they are in the system. But at the same time, outside of the campuses, they are organizing things, reading groups, 
they um, they start um, what they call these indie presses or the independent presses. Um, they start um, you know journals, online journals, um, which are uh, uh, produced in a language that's more accessible to the to the reading, um, uh, the intelligent reading public, who are not necessarily academics. Um, and, and they are thematizing this problem of intellectual imperialism and the need for uh, decolonizing knowledge and, and so on. So I think in this way, uh, it's, it's a slow process. It'll be a slow process, but the idea is to, is to create uh, an intellectual movement among um, the, the younger generation so that um, in time, you know, in, in years to come, uh, the kind of students that will be going to the universities perhaps will be more critical and, and more demanding of uh, um, decolonized um, type of education. Um, and you, you see these movements taking place in, uh, in the US and, and maybe more so, I think, in the, in the UK. Uh, you see this movement taking place in South Africa. Um, and you know, we need more of these um, uh, kinds of, of intellectual movements. Um, and at our stage, you know, we are already quite old. At our stage, I think we need to work on the, on the younger um, generation. And one, one way, I think, is to organize um, um, workshops for the um, younger generation, meaning, meaning for masters and PhD students and young academics, um, but also to have alternative media um, journals, um, which, um, you know, as I said, are accessible, which are of interest to academics, but are accessible to uh, a larger uh, reading public. And we see many of these things already happening in more in some countries than in others. I think in Indonesia, in India, uh, in the Philippines, um, in Iran, um, um, in, in Lebanon, you see more of these things uh, happening than other countries that that tend to be more conservative and more, um, you know, um, uh, status quo um, oriented. But I think these things are beginning to happen. And um, uh, for those of us who are not involved, we need to get uh, um, involved. Okay, so yeah. countering uh, intellectual imperialism through intellectual movements, that's a very uh, good way to start. And uh, I think there should be more connectivity between South Asia and Southeast Asia as well. And there should be more knowledge exchange. There should be student exchange. There should be faculty exchange programs as well. Because whenever somebody from our side wants to go and do a PhD or a higher studies or postdoctoral studies or fellowships, they are looking towards the West. So whilst at the same time we are trying to decolonize ourselves, we are always looking towards our colonizers with due respects to Iftahar Malik Saab for being over there in the UK. But I think we should start more programs with the supposing University of Singapore. Our students could be inducted over there. And um, um, uh, can, I, can I just, may I, may I quickly uh, uh, yes, say, if, if it's all right, um, uh, in that respect, um, um, but about South-South uh, cooperation and, and having more mm. knowledge about each other. Um, I think it's a very important point. Um, mm. And one of the places to begin is um, with the history of, uh, of, of um, anti-colonial and decolonial thought. Um, um, when, you, when you go into that area, um, you discover, for example, that one of the earliest um, uh, critiques of um, colonial knowledge um, came from the Philippines. This is the late 19th century. Um, um, the, um, the Filipino thinker Jose Rizal was possibly one of the first uh, in, in Asia and maybe even uh, in Africa um, to systematically think about the nature of colonial society. But, you know, very few people outside of Southeast Asia would, uh, would know this. Um, uh, likewise, um, very few people uh, in Southeast Asia well, they've all heard of Iqbal, of course, but very few have read him. And fewer are familiar with uh, you know, other thinkers from, uh, from South Asia. Um, for example, I don't think there are any people who know about uh, Kazi Nazrul Islam in Indonesia or, or Malaysia. Um, so that kind of contact, I think, is very important. And you know, we can start these kinds of initiatives um, uh, on our own. I also wanted to say, um, Aisha was talking about... Um, sending students to, uh, to Singapore. We would be you know, very interested, you know, please send us your masters and PhD uh, students. In fact, um, 
I'm all interested in my colleague who happens to be here, uh, Professor James uh, Sidaway, who uh, is in the geography department and he works, uh, in fact, he's working on a pro project on um, um, Muslim decolonial geographies. Um, he also, I, I can speak for him, uh, would be very happy to, uh, to receive uh, you know, students from Pakistan. In fact, he has some connection with, uh, with Pakistan as well, some family connection. Um, so, um, you know, we would really uh, like to, uh, we have many students from India, some from Bangladesh um, and other parts of the, uh, the global uh, south, um, but very few from Pakistan. And I think we would like to, you know, to, have, uh, to have more. Okay, thank you. There's a question from uh, Iftikhar Sab, you want to add something? I just want to add uh, what uh, Professor Atash is saying, that uh, we need to know more about, uh, you know, these cross-regional uh, precedents and examples. Uh, for example, uh, 19th century, you know, people like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan were confronted with these issues yeah. during the yeah. very, uh, you know, Victorian period of, uh, of colonialism. And Jamaluddin Afghani, see, Jamaluddin Afghani had his own way of looking at the things. And then you had Chibli yeah. Nomani, and then, uh, you know, Sasir Ahmed Khan. And then you get a kind of synthesis in uh, Alama Iqbal and the future generation, like Sayyid Amir Ali. I think we, we need to dig up a little bit more of our history. I mean, yeah. for example, not yeah. much work has been done on Sayyid Amir Ali. Sayyid Amir Ali yes. was, um, yeah. you know, was a, as an ideal role model who synthesized Western scholarship with Eastern scholarship. And he rose above, you know, this East-West uh, divergence or Shia Sunni divergence. We see him in the Ottoman Empire uh, talking to Mustafa Kamal to maintain Khilafah. And before that, he is sending petitions and letters uh, to the members of the parliament to safeguard, um, you know, the interests uh, of the Ottoman Caliphate. He was Shia, but he was standing up for this institution, Khilafat, which was considered to be Sunni, you know, institution. At the same time, he was the first person to write two wonderful books um, in English on Islamic history. So there are these kind of people who are wonderful examples. Alama Yusuf Ali is another one. And I'm glad that, um, you know, Professor Atash mentioned Iran. In Iran, in um, India, uh, to some extent in Pakistan and in Indonesia, there are people who are raising, you know, these issues. So I think my, my suggestion would be to learn about, you know, these kind of uh, efforts yeah. which have been made uh, uh, since, since, since the 19th century. And uh, also, you know, whenever I travel to Pakistan, I am so empowered by the example of Hunza. Hunza has the highest rate of literacy in Pakistan or in the Muslim world for that matter. I mean, I always thought Iran had the highest number of literate people in the Muslim world. And then I started going to Hunza and it's all done on self-help help basis in your own very country, in Pakistan, in those mountains and high rate of women's literacy and attainment. And uh, so, so I think there are these positive examples because I know Franz Fanon was one of the earliest people to write about post-coloniality. And he was deeply concerned about the psychological baggage that colonialism transfers to the colonized people, a severe kind of inferiority complex. But this has to be fought back, this has to be this has to be rectified through empowerment. And I think the empowerment will come with education and education of all kinds, education about the West and education about our own selves. About the question of language, I think we should not really spend too much time in resisting these languages. They have become universal, whether it's English or it's French. I mean, I go to Central Asia, I publish the book on the Silk Road, um, they speak, um, you know, Russian because they have been in the Russian language. The medium of instruction is Russian, all the way from, um, you know, uh, Kazakhstan to, to, uh, to Azerbaijan. But they're also, you know, developing English. They have no, there is no resistance to English. They're also going back to their own Turkic languages. So I think we have to be more tolerant towards languages rather than just taking one single route that, okay, we're going to develop only Farsi, or we're going to develop only Arabic, or we're going to develop only Urdu, and we're going to ignore other languages. We'll be further left behind. I think we have to be more cooperative, but with a sense of attainment and with a sense of self-confidence. I think most of all, what Iqbal talked about is self-confidence. So we need to trust ourselves and we need to trust our priorities 
And I think we, we could gain a lot. And we have made, uh, you know, in the Muslim world, I go around from Morocco uh, to Indonesia, Bangladesh. I see good universities, private institutions, lots of authors, scholarly works being produced. So, so the situation is not really hopeless at all. But yes, we need I think, more efforts. Yes, I think that uh, what you're talking about, this uh, mindset and this having a complex, like inferiority complex, that is what we need to get out of. We need to develop self-confidence in our own indigenous things. And I think that Persia has been a center of learning uh, for centuries. And this region has been a center of learning and center of knowledge as well. The only thing is that we have not been able to probably portray ourselves in that manner uh, in which we should have, or we have not been able to portray our um, own uh, knowledge produced by our locals to the world. I think that is where we have been lacking. And we should also set up some translation centers uh, just uh, as food for thought. Thank you very much for that. Madhya, question, please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Assalamu alaikum. This is me, Madhya Iqbal. Uh, I'm recently writing historical content for our history YouTube channel. First of all, I would like to say thanks to to Ms. Aisha, who has arranged such a unique Zoom session with such great guest and teacher, and I'm honored seriously. Uh, my question is uh, like for Sir Sarid, uh, Sir Sayyid Farid Sahab. Uh, sir, my question is this: uh, Okay, as we were talking about knowledge gap and all things, how we can take a single step when we are having a uh, colonized mind and the uh, prison thoughts and you know zero activity on liberation movement against inequality, racism, imperialism, autocracy, environmental damage, corruption, and especially if I will talk about Pakistan, media surveillance and political vacuum. Most importantly, knowledge gap, how we can bring change within ourselves and when we are not familiar with the basic step, how to work and how to how we can take some actions uh, to bring the change throughout uh, throughout uh, knowledge we have. We really bring uh, we can bring uh, we can bring some change. But a student like me who has done her MPhil, how I can play a little tiny role as a scholar to make myself proud and the people around me that I have done something in this regard, people were not familiar and I made them familiar. How I can, my question is not for like for state and the state organization. This is like, uh, I want to ask you how, how I can do something in this regard. Yeah, thank you. That just, this is very, you know, very good. Um, you know, you, you, you show that you, you have a passion for this, uh, um, for dealing with these problems. And that's a very important um, beginning. Um, uh, you know, I think there there are a number of things that that you can do, and and you know, uh, in in cooperation with your your peers, with your your friends, with your colleagues. Um, w- first of all, you need to be familiar with the anti-colonial and decolonial literature, right? Um, in other words, for example, we have been talking about intellectual imperialism, but but we have been talking in a very general manner because you know this is a, just a short session. But what you need to do now is to go and do the reading on intellectual mm-hmm. imperialism. Uh, actually, it, it, it so happens that in 1969, my father wrote a, a conceptual piece on intellectual imperialism, um, and um, uh, you know it was uh, it, it's a it's a detailed piece that defines uh, intellectual imperialism and its various characteristics. But even before that, uh, I think in 1967 or 1968. Um, the Indian Journal Seminar published uh, a whole issue on academic colonialism. Um, and even a year before that, uh, the famous um, uh, Johan Galtung, the, the Swedish uh, or the Norwegian scholar, uh, published uh, a piece on uh, intellectual colonialism or academic colonialism, something like that. Um, so there, there are some of these... Um, very important works that have been published you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, which talk in detail. Now, when you read in detail, you see, it's, it's not enough just to know in general, in a, in a broad sense, that there is such a thing as intellectual domination by the West. We need to understand the specific traits and characteristics so you have a good understanding of how it is working in your own context, in your own mm-hmm. university, in your own country, in your own discipline, Yes. Um, so, so you need to read, you know, these kinds of basic works about intellectual imperialism, academic dependency, um, Orientalism, Eurocentrism, not to have a general idea, but to have a specific idea, you know, of how Eurocentrism operates. What are the different characteristics of, uh, of Eurocentrism? Um, then you're, and then you, you, you go on to reading about 
how we engage, you know, how we produce non-Eurocentric knowledge. Um, what does it mean to engage in theory building and concept formation in a non-Eurocentric way? Um, for example, I was talking about the concept of religion, right? Now, if we look at Islamic tradition, the concept of religion is the concept of deen. Um, um, if you look at uh, Christian religion, um, the religions ex uh, experience and understand division according to terms like sect and denomination. In Islam, we speak about firqa, for example. All right? So is the concept of firqa the same as the concept of sect in the Christian tradition? If not, what are the differences? Um, this is how we, we, we start, you know, the process of, um, of uh, concept uh, formation. So you need to read and then you need to, you know, have uh, reading groups with your, with your uh, peers. If you have a professor who is knowledgeable about these things, go to your professor and ask your professor to organize a reading group, right, uh, on, on any of these issues that you're interested in. Um, this is how you start. And then as you progress over the years, maybe you and your friends will start a journal, We'll start an online journal dealing with uh, uh, such issues. So it depends on your field of interest. If you're interested in history, then go to some of the you know, historical uh, issues, the historical contra controversies, look at how they were interpreted, look at the sources, the, the, the archival sources, and see whether alternative interpre in interpretations are, are possible, you know, like has been done okay. by, Osama by support Ahmed. and studies. Sorry, okay, sorry uh, Osama Ahmed yeah. and Aisha Fayaz, they have uh, raised their hands. If you could be brief in your questions or comments, and then we will go towards closing this session. Go ahead, Osama. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Osama Amir, and uh, um, I have studied Islamic studies from Punjab University. And uh, my question is uh, uh, related to colonization. That is there a, a uh, is there a gray line between colonization or decolonization? Or uh, how can uh, people of uh, society declare themselves completely decolonized from uh, another civilization? And my second question is related to brain drain. As Mr. Sigit Fried uh, uh, talked about that uh, uh, a lot of students uh, uh, go to Western countries for uh, higher studies. And uh, the, uh, the students who are aiming to pursue their uh, uh, higher studies in, in West are, uh, are con totally confused. And uh, I would uh, give an example like me that uh, 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 I am thinking that uh, I am uh, being a victim of uh, colonization and uh, how would I, uh, uh, I, I can clear myself that uh, what I am going to do is uh, better for my country but, uh, and uh, uh, for myself. Because uh, uh, intellect is not uh, a property of uh, any nation. And uh, in the era where uh, uh, we are calling ourselves a uh, uh, global citizen, and uh, why would we are concerning so much about um, uh, this uh, uh, this intellectual prop properties and uh, intellectual domination of West, uh, etc.? I hope I can. Um, uh, I hope I I brief my question well. Thank you. Is it, is it possible to be totally uh, decolonized? Um, you know, I th I think. Thinking independently is something uh, relative, yes. Um, there, there are always all kinds of uh, forms of hegemony, whether they are external or, or internal. So it, it's a continuous struggle for us to, you know, uh, and a lifelong struggle to, to, to think independently and, and, uh, and creatively. Um, but of course, um, the more independent our, our societies are, our countries are, our governments are, um, the more independent and autonomous our education systems will be, and, and the more hope there is to, you know, to extricate, extricate ourselves uh, or lessen our, our dependence. But, you know, um, the way the world is going today, it, it's going to be a long time, um, um, you know, decades and decades, um, uh, if at all it's going to happen, that um, countries in the global south um, will attain some level of e political, economic uh, dependent, uh, uh, autonomy of, uh, of freedom and, and therefore also intellectual uh, uh, or academic autonomy. Um, there's no use for us to speculate about that. What is important is that we start doing the work of, uh, of decolonization. And you see, it's not enough to talk about it. It's not enough for us to, to have seminars and conferences. 
you, you know, your generation has to start doing the work of intense reading. Th th that's why, you know, I gave the example of Jose Rizal and Professor Iftikhar Malik talked about uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan and, and others um, from your part of the world. You need to read their works. You need to read, read about their struggles to know how they went about it, um, how they were so much involved with, uh, not only with ideas, but with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with concrete um, situations of, uh, of their time and how they struggled and to what extent they were successful, to what extent they were not successful, then you have an idea of how you can work um, in your own context, in your own uh, area, in your own institution, in your own, um, uh, among your own you know, circle of uh, peers and friends and so on. This, we have to go to that level. Otherwise, otherwise we, we, we become like the chef, you know, the chef who incessantly, interminably talks about recipes, but never gets down to cooking. Right, and I feel this is what is happening uh, with, with us. You know, uh, I know people of my generation. From the time I was uh, a, a young graduate student until today, you have people who are still talking about the need to decolonize, but never actually did the work of decolonizing knowledge production, engaging in theory building, in deconstruction, you know, in reinterpretation of history. They talk about the need to do it, but never actually do it. So study how other people have done it. People of your of the previous generation, of my generation, of my father's generation, study how they did what they did and start to do the work uh, yourself. In terms of actual concrete activities that we can do, that we can discuss at another, uh, on another occasion. Yes, like I've just said it uh, and repeated it many times, and this is just one of a series of sessions, of course, the work of uh, centuries cannot be undone in just one session and we cannot move beyond that just uh, in two hours. But it is important that we move out of the slave mentality today and we decide to move out of the victim mentality today as well. So no use blaming the colonizers. They did a wonderful job. We need to pay some respects to them as well because they did such a marvelous planning. Sometimes I just marvel at them that they could plan so much. And with just a few people, I was reading somewhere that East India Company had less than 30 employees at one point in time. So they could manage to plan and rule so many uh, with just a handful of people. So uh, people who have joined us today, inshallah, they will be the means for starting something meaningful and something practical in South Asia in the times to come and very near future, inshallah. So Aisha Fayaz, another young uh, lady who is an MPhil uh, and an aspiring PhD had joined us and she had raised her hand. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and add some brief comments or questions. Wa alaikum as alaikum. My name is Aisha Fayaz and I'm working in the University of Management and Technology and Sociology Department. I have a question here. Like why colonial mentality is still impeding the progress of col colonies? Please, uh, I would appreciate if you could like uh, answer that particular question. Thank you. Okay, I'd expect a brief answer from uh, Dr. Farid Sab on this. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, um, you know, uh, Professor Iftikhar um, mentioned uh, Franz Fanon, and and um, uh, the, the the quick answer is this: um, go and read the works of um, you know several of the the the, the negritude and pan Africanist. Uh, um, scholars and activists like Franz Fanon, um, Aimé Césaire, um, and, and others, you know, from, from the, the Pan-African movement. Um, closer to home, you have people who in, in, the, in the 19th century already began to, in India, to talk about um, the problem of the colonial um, mindset. Uh, my, my father wrote about the captive mind. He, you know, he conceptualized the idea of the captive mind, the idea of mental um, captivity. Um, and then it, Ngugi Watyongo was mentioned, Many people have, you know, attempt to deal with the answer, uh, with the question that you have uh, have raised. But it has to do with ideological um, conditioning, with interests, uh, with the role of the state. There's so many issues involved, right? I think it's worth discussing this in some detail. Maybe, you know, we can, this is one of the issues that can be taken up later. But I would suggest go and read these works um, because they will you know, certainly benefit you. Franz Fanon, in Wretched of the Earth, uh, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, writing in the context of Brazil. He also discusses these issues uh, at length. So you'll find, you know, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, many people have um, discussed the problem, and you'll definitely find some of the answers uh, there. Okay. If uh, uh, before ending this session, I could request uh, Dr. James to 
give us some very brief insights because the geographical context of colonization has been very important as well. And it has been largely ignored. We have not really paid much attention to it. It does not seem a mere chance that as the colonizers left us, they left a lot of geographical disputes over here as well. The geographical demarcations of the nation states, they are very important in understanding the, colon uh, the colonizing project uh, in, at large. And I do believe that the way India and Pakistan were divided, the way the Kashmir region was divided, the way so many other places were geographically divided, so um, this was not mere chance. And we have uh, certain historical proofs uh, to back these things as well. More research needs to be done in these areas. So uh, if I could just request Dr. James, if he could give us some insights on what geography means for the colonial project or the decoloniality project. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is James. Um, it's, um, it's a very big question. I mean, I, I've, when I've been listening, um, you know, I found myself thinking about questions of territory, uh, questions of sovereignty, you know, and the way that the kinds of uh, discussions um, uh, we've been having this evening, you know, uh, are all uh, always essentially uh, also territorial questions, uh, also questions of uh, uh, you know, of sovereign uh, uh, spaces. I mean, what, one thing that, that did occur to me in terms of, uh, you know, complex uh, relationships of territory um, uh, um, beyond partition, you know, uh, per se, of course, the kinds of internal dynamics within post-colonial uh, um, and former colonizers um, so, I mean, within the UK, there was a brief mention of Brexit. You know, the dynamics that emerge in the post-imperial polity of the UK uh, are intimately linked to the complex relationship of the kind of empire that Britain was. Likewise, within Pakistan, you know, the historical relations uh, with Bengal, uh, East Pakistan, uh, the Bangladesh story, but also the dynamics that are present uh, within uh, the space of uh, Pakistan today, you know, also reflect issues that are close to those, you know, that we have touched upon uh, today of space, uh, of power, uh, of coloniality. I think uh, these issues really demand, you know, another session. I, I you know, th th I don't think that they are things that we can... Uh, uh, we can uh, uh, tackle uh, tonight. But I think what I would say is that we should always have these questions of space and power in mind because fu fundamentally the colonial project is a project uh, of ideological and political domination. But first, you see space. You control territory. The control of territory and the control of space is a necessary uh, component of the ideological, uh, cultural uh, project. And in that regard, the projects of decolonization cease and assert uh, uh, control over space. But that in itself uh, uh, is also a project uh, that has a geography of culture, uh, uh, a geography uh, of knowledge at its heart. So I think what I'm, what I'm arguing for, and uh, 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 Farid uh, and myself uh, usually have these discussions uh, uh, post uh, Juma on, on, <laughs> on a Friday afternoon, um, we'll have to suspend them for Ramadan, uh, inshallah. But um, uh, what I'm arguing for is the essential uh, reference to questions of territory, uh, uh, questions of space, questions of place within the kinds of discussions uh, that have been uh, unfolding uh, tonight. W w with your permission, I, I won't say anything more uh, about this now because I, I think it's something perhaps to uh, 
you know, to return to um, in, uh, in, in a future uh, session. But, but thank you for, for inviting me to speak for a moment. Thank you so very much. And I also do believe and endorse that since it's all about geographical space and invasion of geographical space first and then the intellectual space. So I think that the decolonization project would not be complete without this. And there's so many bones of contention that are uh, geographically linked and they are still continuing. So I'll just um, end the session with a few questions. And these questions are food for thought and some questions that we would be looking upon in the future programs that we inshallah hold in this series. And one thing that I would be interested in looking at would be that how can we understand the message of Iqbal as a political poet and a revolutionary thinker? I think that we have uh, had very, um, uh, you know, small doses of Iqbal and doses that are very light and not communicated in the revolutionary manner that Iqbal had meant them to be communicated in. And I think I will have his grandson, Iqbal Salahuddin Saab, to convey the actual message that Alama Iqbal uh, wanted to convey to the nation. Also, I would like to know what steps can be taken to create an anti-colonial praxis in decolonizing the research spaces in the academy. Like today, we have started off with some of the things, but how can we actually go about this process? Then also, like I've uh, stated earlier, is there a scope for South Asia and Southeast Asia to move beyond geographical divides and come together for common goals and regional development. Um, and we could start with this um, intellectual exchange first and foremost. What are the commonalities between the colonizers of South Asia and Southeast Asia? What were the main motives of colonization? And what is the role or what should have been the role of academics and intelligentsia uh, during this period of colonization? And what role can the academia and intelligentsia play for the decolonization? Because uh, I think this is very important to understand. Negligence on the part of academics can have lasting impacts or impacts that centuries will have to bear. So I think this is very important. Also, we talk about the negative impacts of the colonizers most of the time. But what are some good things that uh, they have left us with? I think we should be touching upon these themes in the future. Um, Anila seems to have a, a question. If it's a short question, please write it in the chat. There are some questions in the chat as well. Uh, I just like to excuse for now because we've already uh, been um, in the session for more than two hours and there are um, academics from all across the world and I would not want uh, to take more of their time. So I would just like Dr. Sayyid Farid al Saab to wind up the session with his closing comments. And we will be having further uh, sessions, inshallah, and not just sessions and not just uh, talk for the sake of talks. Inshallah, we'll be uh, doing some practical things and whatever we've done today, I'll just send out a things of a uh, list of practical uh, summaries that could come out of this. Thank you very much uh, for, for um, Ms. Aisha for organizing this. Um, um, I, I'm very grateful to um, to you and and to uh, colleagues here, especially to um, the, the the panel the panelists, uh, also to Professor uh, Iftikhar for his uh, comments. I, I'm glad that um, we we all seem to be uh, like-minded, um, and uh, I and I, I look forward to to further meetings where we will perhaps talk about concrete um, uh, programs, uh, concrete projects that we could uh, organize, especially those that that involve um, um, you know the, the younger um, scholars and um, and students, um, so that um, you know that there can be some concrete steps taken uh, towards um, uh, more creative um, and, and autonomous knowledge production. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the esteemed guests. And uh, especially to Dr. Sayyid Karim Al-Tarataj Saab, Ishtar Gundan Saab, Iftikhar Malik Saab, uh, Dr. Safir Awan Saab, and so many other distinguished guests who have joined us. Thank you very much for your time. I'm very sorry that some of the questions have remained unanswered, but this is just the first of uh, our series, inshallah. And we will be having more of uh, similar sessions, and then we can discuss these questions in detail. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz.